This morning, Bruce will be interviewing JAMS mediator Howard Herman, one of the most knowledgeable individuals on core ADR programs. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to submit those using the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we'll do our best to address as many questions as possible, uh, probably in the last 15 or so minutes of today's webinar. And with that, Bruce, if you're ready, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Always appreciate the kind introduction and all the good work you do to support our efforts at uh, Edwards Mediation Academy. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce Howard Herman, who's not only an accomplished mediator at JAMS uh, and a friend, but certainly one of the uh, people responsible, I think, for developing court uh, mediation uh, programs in the United States that have really become the gold standard for how courts approach uh, ADR uh, in the United States and to some degree now in developing countries around the world, as we're going to explore that in more detail in the next hour or so. But welcome, Howard. Thank you for your generous gift of time this morning. Thanks so, so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Bruce. And welcome uh, to our friends around the world, uh, and particularly those uh, individuals from Rwanda who are joining us this morning. After our uh, wonderful graduation ceremony, we were able to do yesterday uh, virtually in the presence of uh, the Chief Justice and over 90 uh, participants. So hopefully many of you are able to join us today as we continue the discussions about how to implement uh, <clears throat> dispute resolution programs uh, in various court systems. Um, Howard, let's, let's get into it this morning. Um, I think everybody uh, has a story to share. Uh, people appreciate hearing how others have found their way into this profession. Let's get to know you a little bit uh, before we get to, into the detail. Uh, how did you find your way into mediation? Um, so I, I became interested in mediation actually in law school, um, in, at, the, at the very end of law school. Um, uh, I had the good fortune of um, editing a law review article um, uh, at the Hastings Law Journal, uh, written by Tony Piazza, who is a well-known mediator, and another uh, uh, and, and one of his colleagues, Barbara Ashley Phillips. Um, this was in about 1981 or 82, somewhere around there, and they had written an article about the use of mediation in um, public interest disputes. Um, and I had actually thought that I would become a public interest lawyer. Um, it was, uh, was uh, um, uh, mediating a symposium on, on that topic. Um, but uh, uh, I was uh, uh, intrigued by this article that, uh, that Tony and Barbara wrote. Um, and that was sort of my first inkling. Um, after law school, I went into, um, private, uh, into private law practice. I actually did not end up in a public interest job. I went to a big law firm, uh, Graham and James, which is now part of uh, Squire Sanders, which is a giant international law firm, um, and had um, some uh, important um, learning experiences in my first couple of years as a lawyer. Um, I, I, again, wouldn't happen today, but as a very young lawyer, had the opportunity to be to second chair a federal court jury trial um, that involved um, uh, a shipment of Persian rugs. Uh, it's a two-week trial. We were um, uh, and we invested unbelievable amounts of time and energy in this trial, um, uh, and uh, defense the case. It was a great victory. The clients all celebrated with us, and uh, two weeks later, we got fired. <laughs> um, and we got fired because we'd been so focused on winning, and we thought that's really what the client wanted. But it really, we spent so much money <laughs> um, uh, in, in, in this great victory that we really hadn't recognized what the client's underlying interest was. Um, and that was a really early lesson about what the strengths and weaknesses of a traditional trial um, might bring. Um, fast forward a couple of years, and I'm like most young associates at big law firms, a little bit antsy and not so satisfied. Um, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, our federal court of appeals, advertised a job 
um, that had a mediation component. It was essentially um, being on the staff, um, assisting the judges um, yeah, it, with research and, and some, uh, some such. Um, but halftime was devoted to the idea of experimenting with managing cases on appeal and seeing if they could perhaps be settled. So now we're about 19, the end of 1985, the beginning of 1986. Mediation is just beginning to really bubble up in the American legal system. And I got in on the ground floor of this um, pretty exciting appellate mediation project. To your knowledge, to your knowledge, Howard, was that the first of those opportunities to arise in the United States? Well, there were actually three circuit courts of appeal that were experimenting with these ideas. The Second Circuit in New York, the Sixth Circuit in Cincinnati, and the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco were all looking at, um, at this idea from different angles. Uh, and uh, the Ninth Circuit in particular was a program that kind of bubbled up really from the staff um, of the circuit who realized that you know, on appeal, unlike the way that uh, cases are sometimes handled in trial courts, on appeals, um, there really was no mechanism at all for the court to manage even petty kinds of disputes in the briefing phases and such. Um, so the idea of managing a case by the judges was kind of, it just didn't happen. If you had a problem, you, you made a motion and it went to a panel of judges to decide. So the staff realized that if they could just get on the phone with the lawyers um, and maybe iron out even minor disputes, that things could um, run more effectively and efficiently. And then they began to realize that, um, uh, well, some of those conversations morphed into broader um, problem solving than just you know managing how many pay, you know, was, was there gonna be a, uh, a, a, a fight over uh, the way that briefing was conducted or um, uh, uh, the need for some uh, interim relief uh, while the appeal was pending. Um, and they actually settled a couple of cases. And that's about the point where I came in where they were really seeing, oh, this has some potential. Oh, interesting, so, in, interesting to observe, Howard, that uh, almost a serendipitous uh, uh, move into the uh, mediation world by the courts of appellate jurisdiction. You know, you would think that uh, you might have started from the bottom up, so to speak, uh, but no, this was a little bit of a more lateral intervention. No, that's right. It, 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 and it, it was, an, and it, is, it remains um, uh, an anomaly of the federal court system in the United States that the uh, courts of appeal actually have many more resources devoted to mediation than the trial courts do. Um, and that there's a, there, there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, in part, it goes back to the very beginning that there were these early developments um, in a few circuits, um, which then actually led to um, a, a more stable funding base for, the, um, for, for the, these programs um, at the appellate level. And um, all of those courts use um, uh, full-time staff mediators who are regular employees of the court, um, which is pretty different from the way that most trial courts in the US structure their, um, their mediation um, practices. Howard, and before we get too far down that path, because I do want to ask you questions uh, ahead regarding some of your experiences, which are, are many, um, I'm going to ask you to do something more difficult today, which is to try and put yourself back in the mindset of many of our listeners today who uh, have even maybe less developed court systems, have not broached the whole concept of court uh, um, annexed or supported programs of mediation, and really from a nascent moment, I want to kind of walk through the process of how one identifies and develops that kind of program uh, in a more purposeful way, perhaps, than, than how we kind of stumbled our way along a little bit. I don't mean that pejoratively, but just experientially. <laughs> oh, no, I think that's right. That We did stumble along here, but we don't stumble along anymore. And when a court now, when, when a jurisdiction looks at this um, anew, <laughs> um, uh, they're not starting from the beginning and they don't have to stumble around. That's right. 
if, if people uh, out there are listening to this and they're just beginning to envision the uh, prospects of a, a court a, a supported uh, ADR system and particularly mediation, what are some of the uh, strategic or logistical steps that go into that formative in, envisioning you know, kind of moment? What are the, what are the things that uh, they should be thinking about? Well, I think first and foremost, um, it's important to identify what you're trying to accomplish by, uh, uh, by providing an ADR system um, in conjunction with, with the court. There are lots of different reasons why um, an ADR system might be useful. And depending on what you're trying to accomplish, um, the, the, the system might look um, quite different. So, um, for example, um, as I was mentioning about the Ninth Circuit and its beginning, um, it began from a case management impulse. And if one thinks, you know, retrospectively about what we were doing when we were stumbling around, um, the, the need that was identified was really for um, case management and for um, uh, utilizing uh, a previously un, unexplored settlement window in the life of the case. And that is the, when, when a case is first appeal, uh, appealed. Um, so um, the system kind of grew from that idea. Um, sometimes a court is interested in um, dealing with the backlog of cases. In fact, that's often a very common um, impulse for putting together a program. And then the question is, um, what's the best mechanism for um, uh, just reducing the court's docket? Is the idea to duplicate the results that you might get in court just in a more streamlined, more efficient manner, that might lead you to create an ADR system which is less about mediation and might be more about a streamlined arbitration process or a small claims process. So it all begins with identifying people's needs and interests, if that doesn't sound familiar to uh, most of us. <laughs> no, exa it, exactly. It is like what we do in a mediation. You try to take the problem apart and figure out, well, what is really your need? What's your interest? What's the goal in putting together the program? Um, and, you know, to use Frank Sanders term, fitting the forum to the fuss, thinking about, well, what's the problem here? What are we really trying to fix? with an ADR system, or what are we trying to add with an ADR system, and then designing from that, um, from that um, place. And before, before we get to the design piece, which we'll get to momentarily, uh, I assume implicit in your uh, comments is the notion that people should really be uh, contemplating a planning team logistically, and maybe casting a wide net of, of potential stakeholders. Touch on that for a moment, if you would. Oh, absolutely. So, um, so that's what, whoever is the, per the person or the group of people who are beginning this kind of envisioning phase, um, from there, the next, the next piece is really about engaging the stakeholders, figuring out who, is, um, who needs to be on board in order for this project to be a success. And in most courts, that means the judges, first and foremost, and it means the lawyers, um, it means the court administrators, um, it likely means um, key litigant representatives to the extent that you can assemble those. So at a, at a, at a and in, a, a, in any market where there already are a pool of people who are trained as mediators, <laughs> Um, or other neutrals to the extent that we're not just talking about mediation, but could be talking about um, arbitration or other ADR mechanisms, you want to uh, ensure that you're also talking to the people who will be the providers of the service. 
and, and, and to emphasize the importance of what you're sharing with us this morning, and you know this well, I'm, I'm telling it for the benefit of others, experiences in some countries, India and uh, Italy, uh, to name two, where they didn't appropriately engage the right stakeholders from the beginning, really set them back as they uh, progressed and found that uh, to their detriment, they'd excluded a key stakeholder group. No, I mean, I think that in the field, I don't know for those who are, who are um, participating today, um, Certainly, there's the, the famous story of the lawyers' strike in Italy and what that did. I mean, they effectively shut down the courts when they were excluded from uh, the mediation decision um, decision making. Let's assume you've got this uh, planning team appropriately uh, assembled and representing uh, the totality of stakeholders, and now you're into that process design or program design kind of moment. What are the kinds of issues that uh, should be part of that conversation? Well, um, I think that, yeah, well, so the first question is, well, what ADR mechanisms are we talking about? Are we talking about building a mediation program? Are we talking about building um, a, a multi-option system? So I wanna take a step back and talk a little bit about that. Um, Many courts um, <clears throat> uh, are driven um, and, and by the concept that I mentioned before, the idea of fitting the form to the bus, the idea that um, was originally proposed um, in the, at the Pound Conference in 1976 by Frank Sander, that really um, there are all, lots of different ways that people with um, problems um, could have their issues addressed. And that a truly effective, responsive court system tries to match the dispute, uh, the dispute resolution mechanism to the needs of the parties in that particular dispute. So um, uh, for me, the starting place is to look at that array of, um, of dispute resolution options and to think about how many of them um, would be included um, and, and what are, uh, which direction are we gonna go or are we going to just focus on, on one particular kind of, um, kind of dispute? Uh, so maybe the distinction between a full multi-door type of process versus a simple or more direct mediation annexed you know, type of program. No, I think that's right. And I think that, um, and it's not a one or the other necessarily. Um, in the Northern District of California, for example, the multi, which is, which is um, a real model of the multi-option system, the multi-door courthouse kind of system, um, it built slowly. The court began by instituting a non-binding arbitration program. And then it moved from there to adding an early neutral evaluation program. And then it added mediation, um, and, it, and it grew over time. And at some point, actually, it abandoned the first option, which was the non-binding arbitration because it was no longer viable. So mm -hmm. it can be an organic and ongoing process, but it is important as you're thinking through, well, so what do we need? What are the elements? Let's identify first, well, which processes are we going to offer? Um, what types are suitable for this particular um, legal environment. Um, another- Do you have recommendations, Howard, about um, people trying to distinguish between, for example, different case types? You know, should people think about starting smaller with domestic cases or landlord-tenant matters or those sorts of things before they jump into a broader commercial world? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, again, I think, I think it's really jurisdiction um, specific. Where you want to where you want to begin, um, and and it's it, it should be driven by the needs of the of, of the litigants and the court. Um, I do think that it's important not to um, not not to take on too much at one time. Again, I, I go to the Northern District where I spent most of my career. Um, and the notion that it built slowly, it was a you know it it, it was probably a 20 year process <clears throat> from the beginning of experimenting with non-binding arbitration 
to a full-blown multi-door courthouse approach. Um, so um, to the extent, and again, this is part of the American experience and it may not work. I know that it cannot always work the same way in other parts of the world, um, but you know, we always began um, with a small experimental pilot of anything before we encoded everything in rules and lots of procedures um, because it felt safer to do that. In a lot of jurisdictions, you have to have rules in place before you're allowed to experiment. So I appreciate that that looks different in different settings, but to the extent that you can um, find a way in your system not to have to have everything cast in stone before the first case comes in, you're probably better, in my opinion, you're better served. Uh, before, before we get to the implementation types of issues, I'm still intrigued by this planning process. And what, what are the kinds of considerations that go into thinking about the judge's role, for example, or the mediator's fit in the program? Give us some thoughts on those issues. So the first question is, um, is this going to be something that the judges mandate? Is it, or is it going to be voluntary or somewhere in the middle? So a core uh, planning issue is whether, when I, how, are, how are the cases going to come in and are they just going to be assigned and mandated to do this somehow by court order? Or is this going to be an offering that the court makes um, and the, the lawyers and parties volunteer their way in. There are pros and cons for both approaches. And, uh, and actually, uh, there's actually a spectrum, I believe, of um, choices that a court can make that includes not just either mandatory orders that certain kind of cases must go to mediation before they proceed in court, for example, um, or a purely voluntary opt-in process. Um, the middle ground would be a presumption that certain kind of cases would go to mediation, for example, um, but could opt out. And each of those things would have dif different implications for what's gonna happen once you're in mediation, um, and also different um, implications for the way in which the um, lawyers and the parties view the program um, and how much they are bought in. In a, um, uh, it's often easier to start with a mandatory program because it means that you've got a steady flow of cases being ordered by the court um, to do this thing. But as you can imagine, some people are going to be opposed um, and they will come into the mediation process, hostile to the mediation process, making it harder to succeed once you're there. Um, but sometimes people need the push, some kind of push for the court. And if you have a purely voluntary system, it may be difficult to actually drum up enough cases to truly get things going. So again, I mean, I, I have always been something of an advocate of, of more of a middle ground. Um, and uh, 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 the idea that perhaps courts are best served with some incentives for people to try this out or at some presumptions, but um, not absolute orders. Another component of this is who is the decision maker? So if you're not in a purely voluntary opt-in kind of situation, um, is the judge gonna order this? Or is there gonna be some other knowledgeable staff person on the court um, who's gonna have some role in deciding which cases go in? Or is it gonna be some kind of an automatic uh, mechanism? For example, everything of a certain case type, all family law matters or all um, uh, personal injury cases, for example, could be just trapped. Um, the um, uh, automatic systems are simpler to administer, um, but I have never seen any evidence that shows that a particular case type is actually um, more apt to benefit from mediation than any other case type. 
Um, I, I don't see, I don't, I don't know of any uh, research that shows actual correlations there. In my opinion, anything that could, any case that where you could have a settlement conversation could be, could be mediated. Um, and that's pretty much, that's almost every case. Um, so, uh, no, the, yeah. uh, no, this is all helpful in ter terms of uh, the obvious, which is there's a lot more than meets the eye in terms of what should be considered and discussed in this process design phase. Uh, right. Touch for a moment on the conversation around the mediator's role in the program and what are those issues that should uh, occupy the conversation of the planning committee as they contemplate the mediator's roles? So the, the one role, the, the first question is, well, who are the mediators going to be? Um, are you going to train some group of judges to serve as mediators? Um, are you going to um, use lawyers and train lawyers to be the mediators? Are those folks going to be employees of the courts? Are you asking them to volunteer some, some or all of their time? Are you going to um, uh, mandate, assuming that you're, you're not putting them on the payroll of the court, um, how are they gonna get paid? Uh, if they're if they're not going to be volunteers, how would you how would they get paid? Is there going to be uh, a mandated amount per hour or per case that the mediator will um, will will receive? And how do we determine what the training requirements are going to be and experience requirements for the pool of mediators? So the planning committee is going to need to address this whole uh, array of issues about the, um, uh, who constitutes the mediator pool. Um, and then once they're constituted, um, how, um, how are they gonna be uh, monitored and supervised and assessed um, uh, to make sure that the program actually has um, real quality? And, and we're gonna get to those important topics shortly as we move into uh, the implementation conversation. Um, are there other thoughts you have, Howard, about this sort of planning moment, this process design phase, uh, things that you might have done differently had you been uh, from the ground up, although it sounds like you almost were, uh, but looking <laughs> back with all your years of experience now, what might do you, you know, counsel people to do differently or think about differently? So let me mention one more thing that I think is important. Uh, that goes in it that the planning people should be talking about. Um, and that has to do with the rules that are gov gonna govern. Um, uh, certainly in terms of mediation, you need to think about confidentiality and the role that confidentiality is gonna play and what kind of mechanism you need there. So that, and all of these things are pieces that you're, you're absolutely right, Bruce, they show up in the, in the implementation phase, um, but almost everything that's in the implementation phase is implicated um, to some degree in the planning in the planning process. Hopefully, hopefully. Ho hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, um, in terms of the, the actual question that you just asked, um, I think the um, most important thing that I would do differently would be to build, would to have built in more mechanisms for um, assessing and evaluating what we were doing along the way. Um, thinking about keeping track of um, it, it, and trying to capture as much as possible um, um, all the benefits that the program was providing. So, you know, along the way, um, uh, we developed you know, surveys that we would send out to the participants and uh, uh, getting their reactions to um, how, whether this was a useful procedure and, and such, trying to capture information about how much money was saved and how much court time might have been saved through the use of these programs. That becomes important um, when funders start to look at um, what at, at, at how to uh, approach 
the institutionalization of these programs. And I think that we um, didn't do, we still don't do anywhere near a good enough job of documenting um, what it is that we're doing in order to prove to people um, the benefits of the programs. Um, the social scientists tell us that the strongest way to do this is actually easiest to do at the very beginning. And that is by establishing a control group um, against whatever it is that you're experimenting with. Um, once you have a mature system, it's really hard to um, establish a control group again because nobody's willing to, to not be in the treatment group um, if they think that it has value. And courts have some problems artificially holding people out of a system that they've already kind of committed to. But it becomes harder to prove that what you're doing actually has any merit um, without some kind of a control group. So if I could go back in time for each of the programs that I was involved in, and there are uh, really three that I've been intimately involved in, you know, personally, um, I would have established control groups at the beginning, and we didn't do that in any of the three. It's, it's a fascinating conversation. It probably extends beyond today, but the whole concept of developing metrics that can measure and ultimately support the value proposition of mediation, whether it's in the court public system, which may have an even heightened need, but certainly something we struggle with in the private sector as well uh, for you know, important uh, information to be able to try and quantify. And that may be a topic for a different day. Let, let's do this, Howard. Let's, let's, um, this has been a great uh, lesson and conversation about the planning phase. Uh, let's in, envision folks are now ready to turn some of these ideas into action uh, in their local communities. And speak uh, first maybe about uh, what those uh, nascent initial steps uh, should include. And I, I suppose there's a whole conversation to be had about creating some uh, statute or rules or directive that starts to, to focus the implementation. But, but take us into that implementation moment. Well, so yes, I mean, there does have to be some kind of a, some kind of a rule or um, uh, order of the court or something that provides the implementation of the program that encode that encapsulates um, what it is that uh, what that the project entails and sets forth the rules of the road um, for that. Um, so, um, uh, in in the programs that 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 we've developed in the, in the U.S., the model that we use was um, uh, ordinarily beginning with a general order of the court as opposed to encapsulating it in a rule of court um, on the theory that um, just some operating guidelines in the form of a general order um, would be easier to adjust along the way as opposed to having them um, put directly into rule or statute. But we did have, an, we, there was always some sort of order that authorized um, the program in whatever, however it was going to work. Um, most courts don't have the resources to um, provide um, mediator employees um, uh, unless they're going to use some um, cadre of existing court employees or judges. But whether you're talking about training the internal in, in internal staff, training judges or internal court staff, or you're going to use outside mediators who are going to be either you know volunteers or on some sort of a panel, the um, uh, I think that the first implementation issue is about assembling that group of folks who are going to serve as the neutrals and providing them. Um, providing them some sort of training. Um, and that training is variable depending on how big a role the court, well, depending on how big a role the court is gonna play in the ongoing administration of the program. And it's dependent also a bit on the system design, how voluntary or how mandatory um, the referral is gonna be. In my opinion, the 
more mandatory the program, the more responsibility the court has for um, ensuring the quality of the neutral. Um, and the more the court is going to simply assign someone to you to work with you, as opposed to allowing the parties to choose whoever they want to be their mediator, um, the court has a responsibility to, um, to, to provide oversight and training of those individuals. Um, so now in the ideal world, um, even if all you're doing is putting folks on a list um, and then letting people choose off of that list, um, you're still giving the imprimatur of the court to that group of people and the court has some level of responsibility. But so for example, in the Northern District of California, we used a, a system, we use a system where um, when a case is assigned to the court's mediation program, um, the court um, chooses the mediator, at least in the first instance, and it will, uh, we have a panel, but the, um, uh, the initial assignment um, is provided where the court matches the person to the, um, to the case, although they'll, the court will take the input of the parties about who might be a, a good fit. But the parties don't simply get to choose. That means there's a higher level of responsibility um, for um, really making sure that the person who's being assigned is somebody who's got um, a decent skill set. Can I ask you a question on that, Howard? As I know um, that most people don't know you well enough yet, but I know you're a, a huge proponent of quality education and training and, and give people a little bit of an example of what you might put people and what you have been responsible for putting people through training wise to, to get on those kinds of lists. So in the Northern District, which again is kind of the, uh, it had a lot more resources than most trial courts um, and in some ways is the gold standard for this. Um, we insisted that every new panelist, no matter how much um, mediation experience uh, they might have had, um, come through the court's own mediation training, um, uh, which uh, 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 the court provides free of charge to the participants, but people would have to apply to be on the panel, um, and they would... Um, uh, uh, and then they, they'd have to come to four full days of um, mediation training um, with a lot of role play. Um, the training conducted by myself actually as the lead trainer along with a lot of other um, uh, very experienced mediators. Um, so, you know, pretty similar to a conventional 40 hour mediation training, but offered by the court directly. Um, and uh, nobody ever got waved out by experience. Um, for one of the examples that I like to cite is that our chief judge, our former chief judge, when he left the bench um, and actually went to jams um, to be a private mediator, um, also volunteered back on the Northern District panel and he came to the four day training um, and sat through the whole thing and participating in every role play just like everybody else, even though he was the chief judge of the court before then. Um, so uh, no exceptions on that score. Uh, Great. And, and while we're talking about training in this implementation phase, let's speak for a moment to the training of judges. You and I have a friend in common, Vic Schachner, who spends a lot of time traveling around the world from Brazil to, to Liberia to, to the Republic of Georgia, training judges you know, in how to be meaningful and effective participants in these court programs. What's your experience with that? And what are some of the issues that uh, uh, come to mind as you think about that aspect of the programming? So um, um, judges can be great mediators. Um, and, uh, and, and I have participated in a lot of you know, VIX programs and, and others and had the opportunity to work with a lot of um, federal magistrate judges who do a lot of, a lot of settlement work um, in, their job, uh, in their jobs at the court. Um, the hardest thing for many judges is to shift their mindsets. Um, you know, judges by definition are judging their, their main day job is, you know, listening to evidence and hearing and, and deciding 
who's right or wrong, who wins and who loses. Um, and the job of a mediator is pretty different from that. You know, the, the, the job of a mediator isn't to tell people what to do, it's to help people figure out whether, you know, whether they uh, are better served by um, uh, finding a settlement of the case or proceeding to court. That entails certainly some analysis of what might happen in court, but it really entails a uh, searching analysis of what the underlying needs and interests may be, which may be entirely uh, separate from the legal decision. Um, it may be about you know, businesses um, uh, ongoing relationships and what's going on in the market, um, in the marketplace, as opposed to you know, who actually breached the contract or didn't breach the contract. Um, there's a whole warrant of other things that would be completely irrelevant to the court decision. So the hardest part that I think that judges have is making that switch. Um, and many of them are, but you know, many of them are great at that. Um, and others have, have, for others, that's more of a struggle. The other thing I would say about um, judges as mediators is that judges are used to issuing orders, telling people what to do. And you know, as a mediator, um, you don't have any power to order people to do anything. Um, that's uh, inimical to the process. So um, getting used to the idea that you know you might be able to persuade folks, but that you can't just you know you that that listening is more important than talking, and that you can't really order people around. Those are core components of a you know in a mediator's in a mediator's uh, uh, toolbox. Um, and some judges are great at it, some are not, just like some lawyers are and, and aren't. I mean, but it, it, it's appreciating that different, that different um, mindset. Your comments speak to the inherent challenges at one level of trying to help judges effectively transition from a judging role into a mediation role. Before you even get to that moment, though, it seems like there's a threshold conversation to be had about whether or not judges, what role they'll play in the program. And are they going to be fundamentally supportive and administrative and the training focused on what cases and how to effectively support the mediation program? Uh, or, or, or and, will they also participate as mediators, which I think is part of what you were addressing. Can you go back for a moment and, and touch on in your experience in, in various programs, are judges always involved on the mediation side? Are there systems that are set up where they're simply and, and, and more um, directly just supporting the mediation program itself? Oh, no, absolutely. In, in fact, the, what the, the latter is probably more common in my experience in, in the United States that the judges, uh, most courts don't choose to have judges as the principal people who are being the mediators. Mostly the judges um, play a, a very important role in managing the case and figuring out what the best approach is, but are referring the mediation to non-judges to or retired judges or people, people who are not actively involved in the case. And, um, the other distinction that's important to make here um, uh, is that um, at least in the US, um, in most jurisdictions, um, it's considered inappropriate for the person who is gonna try the case um, to be involved in, the, um, in, in facilitating the settlement of the case. Those functions are, are mostly separated. Um, and that's a core distinction that um, can look different in different parts of the world. And it does look different. There, there are some jurisdictions in the U.S. where it's, um, uh, it, it, it can happen that the trial judge um, uh, becomes involved in the, um, in the settlement conversation. Um, the concern is that the judges who are making rulings on evidence and who are, and especially if they're not in the jury system, the judge is the decider of the case, that the parties will be quite reluctant to, may be quite reluctant to share with the judge um, information um, and to be really candid in settlement conversations 
um, if they're in front of the same person who's going to be deciding the case. So um, really, the most fundamental question is whether you know, the degree to which the trial judge is going to know anything at all about what's actually going on in the settlement process, which circles back to the confidentiality rules. And again, those are things that look that may look different jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I think most people in the mediation world feel pretty strongly about keeping what happens in the mediation separate from what happens um, at the trial. Did you, uh, Howard, in any of your experiences working with the courts developing these programs, did you see the need or in fact, implement what I'll call like a Vic Schachter type training of judges to help them identify the types of cases to, to develop the logistical processes for supporting the, the program? To what extent is the, the judge training an essential part of this whole conversation? Oh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's key that there be judicial support for what's going on. I think that the success uh, I don't know of any programs that are really successful anywhere without the judge's understanding of the programs and their support of them. If the case, and, and most systems end up with some association between um, the judges who are managing their, their caseloads and the program. So the judges usually are playing at least some role in the referral of cases to mediation. That means that those judges need to understand something about, well, what does mediation really look like? Um, and how can I figure out which cases to send and which cases not to send? What are the criteria that we might look at and such? So yes, um, um, in all of the projects that I've been involved in, there's been some degree of training of the, of the judges about the system. It's variable though. So in the Ninth Circuit, in the appellate world, um, it, in the US, um, at, at the federal level, um, cases don't get assigned to judges um, until just before oral, you know, just relatively uh, early, the, until the briefing is done and the cases are ready to get assigned for, to a panel of judges to hear the oral argument. Everything else is handled by staff first. So there's less need, the judges, the actual appellate judges are less engaged in referring cases and all those courts use systems of either kind of some kind of automatic referral or they will do some kind of telephonic assessment of cases to figure out, and, and that's all delegated to staff. So what the judges there need to know about is they need, to, they need to know of the program and they need to know enough about how it works that they can, um, uh, that they're supportive of it, but they're not engaged in a hands-on way about figuring out referral case by case. Although sometimes, um, once the program was very well established, cases that were fully briefed and actually argued, sometimes the, the result of the argument is a referral back, but that's, a, that's kind of a mature um, uh, result. And there wasn't a lot of direct training of the judges to, um, uh, to refer cases to appellate mediation. Contrast that with what went on in Contra Costa Supreme, the state court where I was involved in a program or at the Northern District of California, that, that program, um, in all of those cases, the judges um, were actively engaged in trying to set case management schedules and such with the parties, and they really needed to know, well, um, when, when the parties appear for their first case management event, um, the judge was actively involved in, um, should this case go to mediation? Um, uh, uh, in different ways. So those judges needed to know something more than the Ninth Circuit judges about the actual day-to-day -day mechanics of how the program worked. And they also needed to know something about, well, what would be a case that might be uh, useful and when would be a good time to refer cases? Because this is another element we haven't really addressed so far in this conversation. Um, 
a, a lot of times the question for the judge is about how, when should this case get sent out? How much information do the parties and the lawyers actually need before they're referred to mediation in order to have a productive settlement discussion? So in a, in a, so things that we would, this is, a, here's an example of what, how we might go about talking with the judges in a training about that issue. Um, in a case where the parties likely know e almost everything that they're going to know about the case before the case was even filed, because, you know, it's a contract dispute between um, two partners in a partnership arrangement. The partners to the dispute, they're, they're having a dissolution, they're having a, a problem with the, the, the underlying partnership agreement. There are really probably very few facts that need to be developed through depositions or formal discovery or any kind of information exchange because the principals really know most of what there is to know about the case. There really isn't, that's a case that might have an early settlement window and a, and a really um, early um, referral to mediation might be very productive. Contrast that to, with it to a situation where um, the parties are, are, are in a personal injury dispute and the injuries to the plaintiff are not yet stable. So we don't, you can't yet evaluate um, um, what the actual damages are gonna look like because we need things to settle down a bit and we need more medical evidence to be developed. It wouldn't be useful to send that to a super early mediation because you're not, no one's gonna be ready with the information base that they need to have a productive settlement discussion. Maybe what you should do as the judge in that case is think about, well, what's the, what's the corpus of information? How can we get the, the key pieces together um, and exchange that, that information on the table and then send it to mediation? Where's the earliest settlement window? So the nature of the training and the conversation with the judges is helping them to, to think about the litigation in terms of um, where are the best settlement windows where a referral to mediation might be helpful. And this, that's very helpful. And your, this conversation underscores a point we have not yet addressed, which is in many of these countries, not only might the judges be the ones involved in a, a process that you described, but it also might include intake staff like registrars. In many of these countries we teach, as you know, will train registrars and, and staff to be fully fluent in the mediation process and uh, appreciate just the nuances of what you've described, Howard, you know, when, when to um, refer cases to mediation. I, I assume in some of your programs, you're including staff in these training moments as well. All right, whoever is involved in the referral process needs to have this kind of training um, as, a, as, as a base. So actually in the Northern District, it, like in some of these countries, the fact is um, a big component of this referral process was delegated to me and my ADR staff. So the judges did a certain amount of this um, in uh, their um, case management conferences, but we actually had a system in the Northern District where there was a presumption that the parties were gonna choose something off of the multi-option, out of the multi-option system. They had a very early deadline to tell the court um, we're gonna do mediation or we're gonna do non-binding arbitration or whatever the process choice was. Um, and, uh, and here's the timetable and we wanna do it by such and such a date. And if the parties didn't submit a stipulation that they were in agreement about that, the case actually came to me or one of my staff to do the initial conversation. And we would have a phone conversation where we would assess the case, try to help the parties to reach agreements without the involvement of the judge. Um, and then if the judge, if the parties couldn't reach agreement on that process, um, then it would go to the judge who had the authority to order something at the case, at the first case management event. But we had actually built a system that may not be unlike what a lot of countries would want to use the registrars for. That actually was um, uh, a component of the ABR offices um, function in the in in our court here. 
And as you point out, not every developing country or system would might have the resources to have the kind of staff that you were able to orchestrate, at least at the outset. Um, what we're talking about, and, and before we move on to sort of maybe the next stage of people's thinking and, and developing the process, uh, I'm reminded because I spoke this week with a mediator in Argentina who happens to be an accountant, but a very accomplished mediator and a very accomplished mediator. And um, I'm just reminded we haven't touched on this concept of in, in the court programs that you've been a part of, are the requirements such that uh, only those with legal backgrounds can apply and become uh, uh, court-sponsored mediators in the various programs? Or is there room for a broader net uh, with uh, backgrounds uh, representing a more diverse uh, population? So, this is a hard question for me because I have a philosophical view about this and I have a practical view about this. So first, let me tell you what I believe in principle, which is that there are lots of mediators who are not lawyers, who are really, really terrific mediators and have a lot of skill and are very capable of handling mediations inside a court program. Um, and as a practical matter, when we attempted to implement that, in the Northern District of California, um, we failed um, pretty badly. Mm -hmm. um, the rules of the court still allow for non-attorney mediators to apply and they will be taken into the program. But we have had very poor results in terms of the ability to um, place non-lawyer mediators in court mediation, in court mediations, um, because there is great resistance from the lawyers to using the non-lawyer mediators. So we'd have a few examples. Um, one is an accountant, one was a human resources professional, um, uh, where you know they 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 had enough experience um, uh, the accountant sometimes served as an expert witness in court. They had familiarity with the court, enough familiarity with the court system and enough credibility with the lawyers that they would occasionally be able to be used. But in litigated cases in federal court in the U.S., um, you know, the, the, the lawyers have a hard time accepting as their mediator um, anyone who doesn't have a legal background. And that's sort of the raw reality that bumps up against the philosophical commitment to the idea that you really don't need to be a lawyer. Now, I, I, I guess I hasten to say one more thing about that. Um, I think it's understandable, um, that resistance, because in a piece of uh, in an important piece of litigation, really in any piece of litigation, a big piece of what the parties and the lawyers are doing in the mediation process is examining their BATNA, their best alternative to a negotiated. And the BATNA in a court case, the uh, alternative is about what's likely to happen in court. So it's understandable um, that the um, parties would want someone with legal training who would be able to help facilitate the conversation about what's likely to happen in court. And you need to be a pretty skilled mediator, non-lawyer mediator, to be able to, and, and pretty sophisticated about what court looks like, even though you're not a lawyer, in order to, to, to successfully um, uh, hold that conversation. So it's not, uh, so, so it's a complicated issue and it depends on your um, uh, it depends uh, on your particular jurisdiction. You know, it might look different if what you're talking about is mediating small claims court cases. Um, that's a different scenario, and there might be more room. Um, it's, important, it's an important conversation to be sure, and I appreciate you f fleshing out sort of all sides of that or both sides of that conversation. Um, as we move from kind of an implementation stage of this program to a bit more of a mature program, maybe one that folks on this call can only sort of aspire to, but what, what are some of the things that, 
a more mature program um, creates in terms of uh, measurables or thinking uh, as you manage that program along the way? What are the things that you were attending to, Howard, uh, when you ran these programs uh, for various courts? So um, the first thing has to do with um, ongoing training of the and, and supervision of the neutral pool. So we used um, a, a hybrid system for, for our neutrals where folks were, we mostly called them volunteers, but they were only, there, there was all, also the possibility of some payment. So our system um, in the district court was that the first half a day, the preparation part and the first half a day of service as a mediator in a court case was as a volunteer. But if the case went longer than a half a day, the mediators were permitted, though not required, um, to um, uh, they, they could they could be paid. They could ask the parties to pay them, and the parties could choose whether or not to continue continue on. And at one point in the program, that was at a court set rate. Actually, the rule now is that after you've done your volunteerism, the parties pay you whatever you know you to negotiate whatever rate you want to with the with the parties. Um, that system um, means that we're actually at, we're actually quite a lot of the of the neutrals, um, uh, many of whom um, are making their living as mediators. That's a lot of volunteerism to ask for people and people. So there, there's kind of an ongoing set of trade offs for the volunteerism, and one of those was providing mechanisms for people to feel like they're getting something back from their service. And um, that had a couple of components. So one had to do with um, making sure that there were opportunities for people to feel a part of a community of mediators. So the court became a, a locus for that. People on the panel um, meeting together as mediators um, and learning from each other. Um, also, um, uh, it helped them to feel a part. So doing events, Sometimes getting to uh, meet with the judges, feeling like um, the court, you know, court appreciation events for the volunteerism, um, because um, the lawyers liked the idea that they could um, have access to the judges in that way, and that the judges saw that people were that the, the work was was appreciated. Um, making sure that people got thanked, you know, sending out thank you notes to them, and and the judges sometimes sending out notes to um, mediators and not just when a case settles, but you know, in, um, in acknowledgement of, of their work. Um, another component of this had to do with, um, in some, so this is all about maintaining the panel. And what does it mean to maintain a panel of neutrals in a mature program? So one aspect has to do with the satisfaction of the people who are volunteering, who are, who are providing service and the relationship between the court and the panel. Another aspect of this has to do with quality control, really. Um, and we had a couple of mechanisms for that. So one had to do with um, really surveying the litigants. Um, so there's a survey monkey uh, survey that goes out to every litigant in every case um asking you know who's come through the program asking people about their experience um and the adr staff reads every single one right when it comes in and it's a way of quickly identifying if anybody's not satisfied about anything and keeps kind of the adr staff aware of what's going on and able to work with parties if something seems like it didn't go i mean work with not so much with the parties with the mediators if something didn't go right now, just because somebody says I, they didn't have a good experience on some electronic survey, that doesn't mean that, it, that anything went wrong. But if you consistently see that, that, that a certain kind of comment is coming in, it clues you into something and it allows the um, ADR program staff to um, intervene before problems develop. Most important, what we instituted at the Northern District. And again, I think this is kind of a gold standard um, approach, um, but it's in some ways the thing that I'm actually most proud of of the years that I spent at the court. 
we instituted um, an ongoing series of what we called practice groups. So, uh, and this was voluntary for the mediators, but um, an enormous percentage of the mediators participated. We started them 15 or 16 years ago, and many of them are still going. What we basically offered people that once a month, groups of mediators, 10 or 12, and no more than about 10 or 12 in a group, um, meet together, um, usually at the lunch hour, sometimes early in the morning, sometimes late in the afternoon. And the idea is that it is an ongoing opportunity for people to come and talk about what's going on in their cases in a confidential environment. Mm. So um, uh, we supervise these groups and basically lead a conversation where people take turns in a confidential way, presenting their cases um, and letting the group um, talk about you know, whatever problems arose. So it was an intensive sort of ongoing mediator education that grew not out of some sort of intellectual concept of what was happening, uh, uh, let's come and talk about confidentiality, you know, in theory. The, the base was what's really happening in the case. And let's have a conversation about what's real, what you're actually confronting as a mediator. These were not dropping groups. These were, we, we would form, you know, 10 or 12 people who would meet the same group month after month. So they established um, a sense of confidence and trust in one another and a real sense of community, which allowed, um, uh, without formal supervision, really, um, uh, the ability for the ADR, the professional ADR staff to get a real sense of what was actually happening in all the cases. And it provided a forum for the neutrals to continue their learning um, in an appropriate way. So- what a, great, what, a, what a great opportunity for both a reflective group uh, uh, to exercise you know, its camaraderie and learning, as you say, and uh, also to get feedback for the court. I do have a question. I want to get to some questions that uh, I know our audience has been posing, but I have one more question, Howard, before we sort of open the door to that. As a, a court program, did you ever feel there was a tension between the sort of uh, effort and need to move cases through the system versus attending to the higher aspirations of our sort of mediation profession? And if so, sort of how did you manage that tension? So, um, uh, yeah, that tension is inherent in every in, in every program. And I just feel enormously privileged to have worked in a court that from, and this, this happened before I got here, so I can't take credit for this. this. This goes back to a very visionary chief judge in the Northern District of California, um, Robert Peckham, and then to um, another JAMS neutral um, who was a magistrate judge for many years at the Northern District, Wayne Brazil, um, who really worked um, closely with Judge Peckham in the earliest days of the Northern District program. They established in the envisioning phases of, of all of this, um, they were really clear that, while it was certainly important to settle cases, that the main impetus for the courts that I, the, the court that I worked the longest for, the main impetus for the program was to provide a quality service to the litigants. Um, and so I never felt inordinate pressure to get cases off the dockets um, because it was sort of embedded in the, um, in the soul of the program from the beginning that um, the, in establishing the program, the court wasn't responding to inordinate docket pressure. Having said that, um, there always was the tension that you described, this, this um, the sense that if, you know, there'd be no reason for the court to invest what, there wouldn't be sufficient reason for the court to invest resources if cases didn't settle um, and if cases languished in the docket. So there was always, you had to be attentive to that. But I think there's a paradox there because I think that the less that you actually focus 
on worrying about how, you know, what the settlement rate is. Um, I, I sort of think that you're, you're out to have a higher settlement rate um, because um, you're not forcing things. Um, and, you know, most cases are gonna resolve, at least in our system, the biggest number of cases resolve. So, you know, relaxing about that actually helps people to do their jobs better. Um, we told the, you know, mediators like to, you know, kind of keep track of, you know, we all feel better when the case settles. But I think it's really important for us to keep our, our focus elsewhere and then the cases will settle. I know that personally, if I become over-invested and feel too much pressure, like I've got to prove myself, the places where I've made the worst mistakes as a mediator in my, in my career have been the ones when I wanted to settle it too badly and I pushed too hard. Yeah. So, you know, just articulating that, making that uh, part of the conversation inside the, you know, in, in the court as well, um, helps to mitigate that pressure. But it's always- with, with that important context, and I uh, emphasize the importance of that context, but so people can have an appreciation for what success a mature program can deliver, it just in very sort of rough sense, can you share with people, did you settle more cases than not? Do you have any kinds of important statistics that people could, could uh, learn? As a general proposition in the Northern District, um, we'd settle about two thirds of the cases that got referred, which is a pretty, you know, given that some of those cases were not there purely voluntarily. We even, even you know, we, we used this kind of presumptive system where you could never really tell for sure um, how voluntary it was um, uh, that people got, got in there because we had this hybrid system where, you know, we were, forcing people to choose some process by a deadline. Um, so people had some pressure that they had to choose something. And then we were kind of cajoling them before they got to the judge and then the judge could order them. So when, when you actually got a referral, it wasn't a hundred percent clear how voluntary it was. Two thirds is a pretty, you know, is a, is a pretty healthy settlement rate. I yeah. think more than healthy. I mean, I think it speaks for itself. If you could, these people in our audience who are looking to establish programs, if they could go to a chief judge and say, uh, well, this may not be a panacea, but on any given day, you could uh, refer a case to this program uh, underway with this type of chance of success. It speaks for itself in terms of the value of promoting access to justice, clearing up court backlogs, and just delivering efficient uh, process. I, I want to do this, Howard, because I, I want to make sure a couple of questions get answered and, and um, <clears throat> as we move along. Uh, uh, Kristen, you've been kind of monitoring, I think, the questions that I've seen flashing across the screen. Can you share one uh, or two of those? Uh, at a, let's, let's start with the first one with Howard and we'll see how much time we have. Absolutely. Um, how can we handle the space and logistic requirements when most courthouses in our country barely have room to conduct our official court business? Really great question. Um, and it's one that we struggled with um, uh, for in, in, particularly in the early years um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Northern District. And also when I worked for the state court, we struggled with that, with that a lot. So one solution is to house these events not in the courthouse. Um, so in, uh, Today, in the Northern District of California, most of the referrals, uh, you know, because we have a panel of outs, the cases are being done by, by practicing lawyers for the most part, um, who have their own offices, and we don't have, and, and so most of the mediation takes place um, uh, outside of the courthouse itself. So that's one uh, potential solution. Um, you know, the other uh, uh, things that we've done is that we tried to, to, to make use of um, uh, any empty conference space that we could beg, borrow, or steal within the courthouse. Um, so, and again, this is obviously going to be quite variable depending on um, your, uh, uh, your, your situations. But you know, in, in our settings, um, uh, we have the courthouses include jury rooms. And the jury rooms are frequently empty. 
So there's a little bit of scheduling difficulties, but you can often find an empty jury room or, or such. So without knowing more specifics about your, um, uh, your, your courthouse environment, um, those have been our solution. Thank you. Kristen? Perfect, I have yeah, actually a related question. Um, some courts have very broad jurisdiction and cover huge land. Is it difficult to bring parties together in person? Is mediation still possible? Oh, mediation, well, again, um, very, um, it, it is very possible. Um, and technology, and I think the thing that the last year of the pandemic has certainly taught us um, is uh, how accessible things are um, over, over Zoom. It's not, um, uh, it's not as good as being in person in, in, lots, of, in lots of ways, but um, there are technological solutions um, by, by using Zoom. Um, in the early days, actually at the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, has an enormous uh, jurisdiction that extends actually from uh, you know, uh, all of the Western United States, um, Hawaii, Alaska, Guam, um, all of that's part of the Ninth Circuit, um, spanning time zones and you know, vast distance. So, <laughs> um, a lot of the mediations are done just over the, you know, are done over the telephone, or at least initially. Um, that you could um, start with people, even if you're not going to do on um, Zoom. Telephonic um, work um, it can be quite effective, um, and then supplemented um, by in-person meetings only when needed. Um, something we haven't talked about. Um, uh, uh, one way that I think about this is called uh, is, is really customization. It's thinking about customizing each dispute to its needs. Um, and um, sometimes starting on the telephone is really the best um, approach. And it's astonishing how often um, when you convene something at the beginning, just with a telephone conversation with the lawyers, that moves to a telephone conversation with the lawyers and the parties, and then it resolves before you even need to meet in person. Kristen, we have time for one more question. Do you want to pose it? Sure. Let's go with this question from Charles. Howard, what do you see as the most needed and important developments changes in court-related ADR, including tech-supported access to justice developments to help move from reactive individual conflict, res conflict resolution to more proactive systemic conflict prevention, management, and resolution? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, so um, I guess what I would say about this is that um, I'm most interested in the last component of that question about proactive systemic conflict prevention. Um, um, in the US context, um, court programming has very much been limited to reacting, to, to being reactive. Um, and that's about funding. So I'm gonna go there, I think, in response because you know, courts have very little incentive currently um, to become engaged in any kind of um, assistance to people before a case is filed. Um, that's how most courts, yeah, that, that's how sort of fundamentally how courts are funded and structured. It relates to the, even the, the size of the court, the amount of funding of the court, it's all driven by case filings. The number of judges that are assigned to work in any court is related to the cases that are actually filed. So the notion of, courts becoming proactive in conflict prevention um, is a very important idea and quite forward thinking, but I don't think it can happen until there is some kind of um, look at the way we fund dispute resolution. Um, and that's a big kind of governmental que question. So I, maybe I'll stop there. Let me do this because that question does uh, sort of suggest uh, 
another question, a broader question I have. And at the, at the, I feel like we barely somewhat scratched the surface in the last hour and a half of all that you have to offer and share, Howard, for which we're extraordinarily grateful. But if I could sort of impose on our friendship by suggesting maybe uh, we'll take a look at some of these questions that have come in from the audience, submit them to you to respond to, and, and along with that, uh, ask you to assemble uh, uh, not an exhaustive list, but maybe some list of resources that people could benefit from, things that have been written in the United States in the last 10 or 15 years on court programs that might help people further identify the issues they should have in mind and troubleshoot some of the potential pitfalls, particularly as they seek to develop their own uh, programs. I'd be happy to do that. And there are a few pretty readily accessible ones um, uh, on the web. So rather than try to recite them you know, sort of off the top of my head here, I'd be happy to circulate something um, uh, following this, uh, this conversation. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, is that Persian rug over your shoulder? Is that just a visual reminder of your initial experience in the trial system with your first client? Actually, that's a rug um, that I got in India when I was uh, uh, on the second or third trip to India doing some consultation with um, some courts in India. But uh, it did, um, that, that first case did spark an ongoing interest in, um, in Persian carpets, yes. <laughs> Although this one is from India, that's right. <laughs> Howard, thank you so much for your generous gift of time. It's really been delightful and personally experiential, just learning more about your background and all that you have to offer. Thank you for sharing it with us today. Well, really, thank you for the opportunity. And I just, you know, it's um, the, the work that um, the uh, Academy is doing is really important work. And it's, um, and it, it's really an honor to be um, involved in, in this sort of conversation with you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Stay well, Howard. Look forward to seeing you soon. You too.